Good afternoon, and thank you for coming to the panel on global mobility. One of the things that is incredibly well understood is the idea that as changes in mobility occur, the global economy grows, and no more so than this region. In fact, I just left the Riyadh Air presentation, and the exciting thought that really captivated the audience was the idea of nobody wants to do the old thing again. And we are sitting at the cusp of a, of a transformation in mobility. And today I'm exceptionally pleased to have some incredible thought leaders here uh, who, who are going to share a really, really wonderful, bold, transformative vision for what the future could be. And perhaps the most exciting aspect is that the, th this vision and this transformation and the world that you will experience is months away. I'm going to start on the far end and ask uh, my dear friend Adam Woodworth a question. So, most of you would imagine that drones are small hobbyist devices or used to be launched to take a photograph of something. And Adam is working with Google at Google Wing as the CEO to build a system that will deliver objects to your home in a matter of minutes. And the question really is, when is it going to happen? And can you scale to a number of deliveries that will actually matter yeah. for people's lives. Yeah, I think that um, out of maybe all of the, the sort of future of mobility topics other than yours, Jobin, um, there's been the largest gap between sort of the idea of what it might look like and the actuality of what it is. Um, we've been at it for a bit over 10 years and even just within the last 18 months, we've seen a sort of tidal shift in the ability to go from you know, pilot programs and demonstrations and sort of science experiments to sort of meaningful business growth. And so, you know, right now today, like there are tens of thousands, if not millions of people around the globe that are in the service areas of drone delivery. Um, and there are a handful of companies, ourselves included, who every day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, are using small automated electric aircraft to go and do parcel delivery. So it's, it's one of those things where uh, we think of it as this far off future technology, but it's people are experiencing it today. Um, and we're starting to see that sort of knee in the growth curve where sort of the year over year per progress is no longer linear. You're in the sort of super linear range. G give me an example of how it's used in the most sort of prosaic way. Yeah, I think um, well, one, of, one of my sort of favorite anecdotes about drone delivery is uh, when we, we started operating in Australia first because that was a place where sort of uh, the regulatory environment aligned with what we wanted to do as a business. Um, and we, before we started operating, we did all of these user surveys of what do you want drones to deliver? And we had you know, hundreds of different options. Um, and the overwhelming use case that everyone selected was like drones should only be used for prescription delivery and sort of emergency medicine. And every other use case is frivolous and like we're uninterested. We offered the service and 80 plus percent of all orders were prepared coffee. Um, <laughs> and this was literally like tens of thousands of cups of coffee delivered by drone. And it, it sort of proved out one, like people rapidly normalize an emerging technology. And two, like uh, sort of these are day-to-day -day use cases. This isn't some sort of extravagant thing. Um, if you offer a compelling service, people will use it every day. So I'm sure all of you have either experienced the flood of lucids ferrying people back and forth around the, uh, con uh, the, the, the FII, and obviously PIF has taken a great leadership role in bringing that to market. However, there are still people who have some concerns about EVs. A lot of it is driven by range. A lot of it is driven by how will the batteries perform. Gene Berdachevsky, to my left, 
is working on a new technology to make batteries much more effective, much lighter, much safer. And uh, I know that you recently announced something really bold and transformative with your company. I'd love you to tell them a little bit about what SELA does, why it's important, and, and how you're going to bring it to the market and hopefully to the kingdom. Yeah, so you, know, you, you, you stated in your opening that when mobility uh, innovations come about, uh, eco economics, um, economies thrive, economies grow. And I think it, there's, a, there's a truth to that, and there's a truth to that in order for new mobility innovations to come to be, you need better energy systems. Uh, you, without the combustion engine, you wouldn't have had vehicles. And so we, um, what we do at SEAL is we are bringing in the next uh, revolutionary set of technologies for battery uh, materials that enable much higher performance batteries, higher energy density, uh, longer range, faster recharge, and ultimately lower cost. And so, you know, um, what Adam, for example, was describing uh, being done today with existing battery technology. Uh, the revolution that we're bringing about is pushing that performance limit even further to enable even more applications in mobility, uh, whether it's uh, further trans transitioning the um, vehicle ecosystem from combustion to electric or uh, enabling, enabling air transport. So um, we're building an automotive scale plant uh, today in, in, in Washington state, about a $300 million investment to produce this technology that uh, seamlessly drops into existing supply chains uh, making every battery that comes out of a gigafactory uh, anywhere in the world today is substantially better, substantially higher performing. So um, we're, we're driving the science to, to enable that, and we're starting with partnerships with Mercedes. So we will be powering their new electric G-Class as our first vehicle, which is a pretty great car to, That's to awesome. start with. A few of those running um, around here. A few of those along with the Lucids here, yeah. Uh, and then um, we also recently announced a partnership with Panasonic, um, and obviously they have... Uh, one very large customer and some others as well, and we'll be powering those vehicles in the next few years as well. That's absolutely fantastic. Jean, you have had a long and illustrious career from Ferrari to running the FIA to bringing Formula One to the masses, and now you are serving the United Nations to bring awareness and safety and a new vision for equality in transportation around the world. Tell us a little bit about your work and, and how you're thinking about it and what your biggest concerns are with some of these new technologies. <clears throat> I mean, first, I mean, it's a pleasure to be here with so, I mean, uh, skilled, new visionary about uh, mobility. You know, we should not forget that uh, motoring is quite new. It's just over 100 years. And uh, when you see the evolution Every decade is absolutely fascinating. And what we see now since uh, a while, I mean, being able to get a delivery, which incidentally is something we discussed earlier, will save lives. Because, you know, it's much uh, safer to get your pizza from a drone than from a motorbike uh, driver, you know. So clearly, and then uh, talking about uh, battery, you know, it's fascinating because we started with a range of uh, 100 kilometers and uh, eight hours of recharging. And now, when I hear that, soon we will be able to do 800 kilometers with a battery without having to recharge. And then I'm very excited to hear about taxi by, by air. So coming back to, to my question, I'm, I've had experience in motor racing, and everybody knows that uh, motor racing is a very dangerous sport until a lot of effort have been done to make motor racing safer. And if you take Formula One, between 1924, when Ayrton Senna and Roland Ratzenberger died in Imola, 30 years after, it has been one dead <laughs> in Formula One. One too much. Today, it should not occur anymore. It was Jules Bianchi about five years ago in Japan. So I think as the responsibility in Formula One and in FIA, I thought, um, what is the situation on the road? until I realized that every year, 1.2 million people die on the road. You have about 50 million of people who are injured with full disability. It's number one cause of death and injuries for young generation, those people who are working on mm -hmm. modernity. And um, I thought it was an interesting challenge, and when Ban Ki-moon, the 
former Secretary General invited me to be for the first time Special Envoy for Safety, I, I took the challenge and um, it will be very presumptuous to me that I make a big difference, but I try to make a very small difference. But small a life is a life. When injured people is when injured people. So clearly, and we know that, I mean, the world is divided. We have the rich world and the poor world. So 92% of the figures that we're mentioning are occurring in low and middle income countries. So that's where, I mean, ev you know, everywhere we need to concentrate effort, but the biggest effort has to be concentrated in low and middle income countries. And our friend here has a very nice logo, which is, I don't know if people know what it is, it's SDG, Sustainable Development Goals. We have 17. Two of them are around the road, 3.6 to have the number of victims by 2030, and 11.2 to give access to public transportation to any citizen. And another thing, public transportation is not obvious. You know, you have half of the planet who do not have public transportation. So again, on one side, we see the fascinating modernity, but I think it's very important to keep one eyes of the world behind and to make sure that the world behind will be able to match the level of the world where we are here today, for example. Thank you, Jean. You know, when, when we were children, at, at least when I was a child, the future was always described by a vehicle that would sit in your front yard and take off vertically and fly away. And until very recently, that was really thought to be the purview of a very expensive military system powered by very large, powerful jet engines that roared and not accessible to the general public. And Joe Ben was so far ahead of his time that he's brought the future to today. And as I'm sure all of you have experienced the traffic in Riyadh, you can imagine transiting the city not in 45 minutes, but in three minutes in silence I think it will be because of the work that Joe Ben has done with Joby. Tell us a little bit about your journey and how close you are to bringing that to these great people. So this was my, my dream when I was a little boy like Adam and uh, when I was in uh, college in uh, the early 1990s, I, I worked on it. And at that point in time, uh, we had batteries that had a, between 40 and 50 watt hours per kilogram of specific energy, which means that you can't build an electric aircraft that can go very far. But thanks to the incredible work of Gene and so many others in the battery space, we've seen incredible improvements in both the specific energy, which is the, ener the amount of energy per unit of mass, the specific power, the amount of power per unit of mass, and the life cycle that you can uh, get out of the batteries. And that's enabled us to build aircraft that have incredible new capabilities, uh, like what uh, the Atom and the Google Wing team have built, um, but at a, at a human scale. And uh, this is incredibly exciting because it allows us to uh, think of a world where we uh, avoid the, uh, the 1.2 million fatalities and the uh, 50 million uh, injuries on the roads every year. One of the incredible things that's happened over uh, the last century of aviation is uh, an incredible effort in the aviation industry to drive safety. And uh, set now today, aviation is not, not only our fastest and lowest cost mode of transportation, it's also dr dramatically safer than any other mode of transportation we have. And so if we can bring that safety to uh, people's daily lives and the way we move around on a daily basis, I think that that's uh, incredibly exciting. If we can bring the, the speed that that Adam talked about, and uh, let us rise, of, rise above traffic. Um, that's incredibly exciting. And, and one of the elements that I'm so passionate about is uh, the acoustics. And this is one of the elements that I've spent the, the last more than, you know, almost 15 years of my life working on is, is how do we build electric propulsion systems for aircraft that can make uh, an aircraft not only take off and land vertically, but also fly incredibly quietly and so that we can 
uh, we can welcome these uh, new types of aircraft, this new mode of transportation into our communities. And so I'm uh, very, very excited. We're, uh, we've uh, flown our aircraft uh, uh, this last year in a demonstration in New York City. Um, and we're going to be uh, flying it at a number, in a number of different countries around the world over the coming months. And we're really looking forward to bringing it here to, to Saudi Arabia. Adam, so when you launch a drone service in a new locale, locality, are people ordering it through Google or are they working with local retailers? How, how do, and, and if you're a local retailer, how do you engage? Yeah. How, do you, how do you bring your product or food or whatever you're, you're, you want delivered to the drone in such a way that it, the timing all works out and everybody gets what they want when they need it? It sounds yeah. very complex. Uh, I think that that is the sort of uh, hidden secret of a lot of these sort of future mobility and automation concepts is like you build the cool robot and then you surround it with not automation. Um, and so you end up with something that is a cool technology, but it's not serving a real business person purpose. Um, one of the things that we focused on for a long time is how do we do that business integration piece so that um, you, know, you look at the workflow of a Walmart, um, it's, it's in, in, incredibly tight, right? Like it's like sort of every step of the process from pick packing to sort of inventory management, all of these things have been highly optimized. You can't sort of say, jump in and say, hey, we're here to help, um, but not accommodate sort of those, those workflows that they've, they've worked a very long time to make work well. So uh, our approach is one, um, we just wanna be the delivery provider. So we integrate with their marketplaces, um, we've integrated with Walmart's marketplace, we've integrated with DoorDash's marketplace, um, and then we've built technologies so that uh, the associates and the dashers uh, can sort of load the airplanes in the same way that they'd load a car that shows up or um, you know, hand off a package to somebody coming into the store. So uh, I think one of, the, one of the sort of missed pieces of introducing new technologies is sort of all the things that exist around them and how you fit them into business cases and sort of day-to-day -day workflows that have existed long before your technology has. So can you just clarify something for me? There's no pilot. No, that's the, that's the, the sort of, you know, our, our aspiration has been to get to the place where the automated aircraft are actually automated. Um, and so uh, our pilots um, still exist uh, mostly sort of to fulfill regulatory functions, um, but they don't have like controls that they can take over and fly the airplanes around. Um, they're servicing uh, like a, a supervisor of a sort of, uh, of an airspace. So rather than thinking of one person to one plane, you think of one person to one area. Um, and managing the sort of exceptions that happen in flight, like, oh, there's a thunderstorm rolling through, or the police helicopter is flying through, rather than saying, like, okay, what is this individual aircraft doing? And I think that's the, the key to sort of a scalable automation future. So, so, Gene, one of the things that if you read in the press, every week somebody is announcing a new battery. Mm -hmm. They're saying, oh, we have a metal battery, or we have a, a, an air-based battery, or a sulfur battery. Mm -hmm. How do you make sense of the battery landscape, and how does SELA and all the work you've done over the last 13 years not become obsolete by some, some new invention or no, some new chemistry that someone cl is claiming is going to solve all the problems of the electric future? Yeah. Well, I, I wish all those announcements were uh, as grounded as reality as, uh, um, as, uh, as some of the things we do or we try to do. But the, but the truth is, you know, battery innovation moves uh, in multi-decade generations, kind of once every couple decades. So in the history of all of humanity, and, and batteries are only slightly older than cars, about 150 years old, there have really been four successful battery chemistries, and you know them all, lead acid, nickel cadmium, nickel metal hydride, um, and sort of conventional lithium ion today. So, you know, 99.9% .9 of all those announcements are early academic works or sort of mid-stage progress, but it takes about a decade from when you think you have an innovation to when it's actually in the market. And, and ultimately, if you're sort of looking at battery technology and asking what's real, what's not, the question is, well, what devices does it ship in today? And, you know, for SELA, we've been shipping 
our chemistry since 2021. We're in millions of devices in consumer electronics today. Um, I mentioned the partners we have in automotive, but those vehicles won't come for another couple of years. So, you know, when you read one of those announcements, the reality is you can probably follow it for five or 10 years and, and see if it matures or not. And by and large, you know, the periodic table of elements, unfortunately, is quite small. <laughs> there's, only, um, there's only a couple things that are they're sort of smaller and lighter than conventional lithium ion on the periodic table of elements. Silicon, which we work on, happens to be one of those. Um, and so, you know, you can, from a theoretical basis, see that, you know, unfortunately, we're only going to be able to deliver a 2x, maybe 3x performance improvements for these guys over the next, really, century. Um, and that's going to take probably a, a decade or two of hard work. So um, that's the, you know, maybe the bad news with, with it. But... Um, but even a 2x improvement, I'm sure, would radically transform the businesses that, that both these gentlemen have and, and would dramatically transform how electric cars are adopted. So um, when, when it comes to energy, making something 2x more efficient is um, you know, as big a deal as, as 20 or 30 years of semiconductor advancements. So John, one of the things you, you mentioned was about sort of the tragic loss of life in transportation, but you yourself were a very competitive motorsport participant in rallying, which for those who haven't watched uh, a lot of rallying, it, it looks terrifying. <laughs> um, can you comment on the evolution of technologies from motorsport to the general public and how that has increased the safety overall for the, the general public? Motor racing is a, is a show, and then uh, you can see lots of the development earlier. It was a panel about uh, e-sport, which is also fascinating. But um, I mean, motorsport has also to be a laboratory. A laboratory, what you learn from the, from, I mean, the pinnacle of technology in motor racing to what you can apply on the cars. And uh, some... Uh, fascinating progress uh, have been done. I mean, some things which, I mean, people do not even realize they have that on the car or they have that on the motorbike, but for example, something which is a, a life saving like a ESC, electronic stability control. You know, it's very cheap, it's below $100, but it's a, it's a game changer on safety. So a lot of all those uh, inventions are coming from motor racing. Now, I mean, you, you, you mentioned the fact that it is true. I mean, I, I love speed. You know, I would not uh, miss for nothing a Formula One Grand Prix on TV. But, um, I mean, you must go on proper circuit for that. When you're on the road, you must be responsible. I think it is very important in your life to be disciplined, to be responsible. And uh, that's a, a kind of of culture, but if people will be more responsible, we will have less uh, injured people and less fatalities for all that. It's also very important education, you know, to educate people. That education is uh, absolutely crucial. There's no question, but I think you make a great point about the, the democratization of technology. Very expensive in a race car originally down to very inexpensive and very commonplace and serving the broader public. Um, I, I just want to applaud the work you're doing in places like Thailand and Myanmar and some of the more uh, disadvantaged communities that don't have some of the great infrastructure that, that we have enjoyed here and back in our, in our home countries. But I mean, uh, on, on that, you know, you need to create more awareness. You, m you should not be used to having crashes. You should not be used to those figures because we all know some people who have been victims because sure. of road crash. So that's something which is very important. And maybe one point on traffic conditions, you know, everybody is losing. You have now more than 50% of the population in cities. By 2050, you will have 70% of the population in cities. And I mean, except um, 
you know, some countries like Saudi, for example, where you have new countries like Nemoth and all that, which are built to think about the future. But uh, I mean, most of the cities around the world are historic cities where the cars were, the, the roads were built for horse carriage, yes. not for the traffic we have today. So we need to find a way to get out. That's why, again, I do applaud what you are doing because it's going to take less traffic. But every day, we all lose hours yes. because of traffic. So what does it mean? Money, tiredness, and pollution. Absolutely. So, so, and we need to speak about that. And I call that, I mean, road crash, traffic, congestions is a kind of silent pandemic. We should not get used to that. We're going to fix that. Joe Ben, if Gene is right and batteries are only going to improve 2x, what if we want to fly 500 miles? What if we want to fly 1,000 miles? How are you going to take the incredible craft you've built and enable it to do much more and go beyond the limitations that we see with battery chemistries? So about five years ago, we started pulling the thread on hydrogen electric propulsion. And uh, it has become uh, more and more promising over uh, that period of time. And with each passing week, I am more convinced that it is going to completely transform aviation. Um, hydrogen has three times the specific energy of jet fuel has 100 times the specific energy of today's batteries. Um, so that's energy per unit of mass. Uh, and we can convert the chemical energy in hydrogen into propulsion twice as efficiently as a small turbine engine can convert the chemical energy in, in jet fuel into propulsion. So you get a 3x times a 2x, you get a 6x uh, reduction in the mass of your, your fuel per unit of uh, propulsion, and that's a game changer. You can take and create aircraft that can uh, fly dramatically farther uh, and can uh, fly dramatically longer. So if you want to keep something in the air for a very long time or you want it to fly very long distances, you uh, can do game-changing things. You can also reduce the energy intensity. So the energy per passenger kilometer or per ton kilometer or per pa parcel kilometer um, by a factor of five, so 80% less energy. Um, and you can reduce the climate impact by over 99%. Uh, one example of this is we took and put one of our hydrogen electric propulsion systems into our vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, and we demonstrated over a 500 mile range. We think that that's just the tip of the uh, iceberg and we've got massive potential to do, to really disrupt the aviation industry at large, where you can, uh, one of the, uh, you know, incredible statistics is, and especially when we're talking about democratizing, is that something like uh, one in five people on the planet have ever flown in an airplane. Uh, and if we think about the, what a game changer it is for our lives, what, how magical aviation is in connecting us uh, and allowing us to see the world and experience different cultures and uh, connect with uh, family and business colleagues around the world, and that's, that's a really special thing that all of us get to enjoy, but that 80% of the people on this planet don't get to. And yet we want to bring that magical experience to, to everyone and we need to be able to do it in a sustainable way. And I believe that hydrogen electric propulsion is the way uh, to, to make that happen. And so I, I'm incredibly um, inspired by the kingdom's vision around uh, generating vast amounts of, of green hydrogen and uh, really looking forward to uh, the incredible innovations in aviation to come. So with that, we are out of time, but what I would like to leave you with is the last 60 years have not had an enormous amount of progress in, in, in the fields of, of mobility broadly. That is changing before your eyes, and a lot of the developments will be seen here first through the fantastic work that folks like the PIF are bringing to the forefront. 
we are thrilled to be a participant. Uh, and I know if anybody has questions, these guys would be thrilled to answer them. Thank you so much.